Okay, no prefacing anything. Let's just get into Act 2 of Wano, right? Because I think Act 2 of Wano pays off a lot of what we set up in Act 1 while also preparing us for Act 3. That kind of sounds vague and like, duh, but here's what I mean, right? In Act 1 of Wano, we see that a lot of Straw Hats blended in and got jobs, and in Act 2, we learn that it wasn't just a hide in plain sight, it was also an attempt to get leads on Kaido's base. Frankie gets in a huge argument with a craftsman after he learns that the craftsman does not have blueprints for Kaido's base, and so Frankie quits. We also have Robin who's sneaking around the bathhouse, which allows her to find out about the weapons and manpower and amount of suspicion the enemy has towards the plan. It made me realize that a lot of what appears to lead to nowhere actually reconnects to the main story. We have seemingly three side stories which all funnel into the main story, so I think we should start off by talking about Luffy and Kid's storyline. I'm gonna butcher this, but at the start of the story we learn about a murder called Hirokiri Kamazo. That guy turns out to be Killer, who's a part of Kid's group, which naturally funnels itself to Luffy's section of the story. It felt so out of left field to bring up this random murderer until we learned that it was Killer who would actually play a role in this act. Especially because I was doubting whether it was actually him even once we knew because he is found chasing and attacking Zoro without the mask with an entirely different set of weapons. And uh, just as a side note because I just gotta talk about it here. Why is Toei Animation cooking? Like maybe it's the fact that we've just been building up to Wano that we've decided to ramp things up to over a hundred? But what is going on? Like, this this is not supposed to happen. Is that just me? I don't know. I can't show you, though, because, you know, uh, Toei would assassinate me. But, you know, you've watched it. It also reminded me that I don't think Zoro has had a good proper fight ever since, like, maybe the time skip. And here, we kind of got a fight. Although it was like a 2v1 kind of situation and you got pretty beat up there. That's rough, buddy. But still... Anyways, we only really find out that that character is killer later on because for the first half, we actually follow Luffy's section of the story. Luffy was locked up alongside Kid and both of them are somehow thriving in here. We're designing a nice rivalry where both of the characters are extremely similar. Kid was, I think, the only other character that I can think of who has declared and is actively after the One Piece besides maybe Blackbeard. We have Kid and Luffy who both want to be responsible for destroying Kaido, which makes it sound like a non-team-up kind of team-up. And both of these characters were thriving so much in these cells that people thought that they were a thief. And, and considering the amount of food that they were eating, I... Yeah, that's crazy. Like imagine being a <laughs> imagine being a side character in all of this and you're just seeing Luffy and Kid without devil fruit abilities with the sea stones, still easily lifting tons of bricks really easily and then casually beating up one of the strongest guys there, the the hippo guy. And it is here where I have some weird thoughts about this prison section, right? Like a lot of the characters like Luffy and Kid who have devil fruit abilities are put in sea stone cuffs. This of course takes away your abilities but also seems to have taken away someone's hockey. And that's weird! Like yeah we have seen interactions where hockey and devil fruits are linked like when someone uses armament hockey against a Logia type devil fruit. But for Sea Stone Cuffs to straight up remove hockey adds a ton of more questions to Sea Stones and Devil Fruits as a whole. It only really comes back when Queen replaces Luffy's handlocks with the neck decapitator thing, which, can we talk about Queen? First, for the location he is in, he's got an audience everywhere he goes. Where Impel Down was like a sadistic place where people enjoyed torture in a very non-outwardly showcased manner, here we're outright making a performance out of it, we're dancing, we're setting up stakes, we're not ending the quote unquote show too early. And in the anime, we exaggerate this to a whole nother level. I like it, Balut has funk. So I think we saw Kid probably at his lowest at the end of Act 1, seemingly without almost any of his crew. And in Act 2, we see that he lost his arm to Shanks? Which as a side note, that's pretty funny. I like the idea of Shanks just stealing his arm. <laughs> so Kid is utterly in pieces, quite literally. Something that becomes even more heartbreaking later on when he discovers where Killer is. I think Kid and Killer have a really interesting dynamic. They got that honorable tag team duo vibe that Luffy and Zoro have, but without the plot armor? We see Killer broken down and Kid unable to do anything to help. 
I've mentioned before that I think a lot of devil fruits are thematically resonant to their users. For example, Whitebeard having the tremor fruit because he literally could shake the entire world. And Kid, very poetically, has like the magnet fruit and is able to put himself back together in even the hardest of times. I love seeing him just walk away with the robotic arm he has now. And in this prison section, one of the many things that we're doing for Luffy's story arc is giving him an intimate purpose for the fight. In Act 1, we had Otama, who was connected to Luffy and had this history with Ace. In Act 2, we have the Yakuza guy who helps Luffy, and it turns out that almost all of the soldiers are kept there, now willing to fight with Luffy when Luffy puts his life on the line. The structure of how Luffy goes around helping people is usually that he takes something external, something that he has absolutely no stakes in, and he puts himself in it. It's not just that he wants to free the people of Wano, but that he shares the burden that people who live within Wano have. He puts his life on the line so that, as others said, he can't just leave and explore other places, and leave the individuals of Wano to deal with a burden even if things get tough. On the other hand, Wano is designed probably as the most group-focused battle we've had so far. Even big all-out wars like Alabasta weren't really about the war, that was more of a side piece that the Straw Hats weren't really a part of, as much as they were just a part of a more narrow fight against Crocodile and his small crew. But in Wano, it is one big cast of characters, all fighting against one big cast of villains. We have a brawl where even if Luffy vs Kaido is the most climactic fight that determines who wins and loses the war, it's the cast of characters who play a major support role in evening the odds. The other side story we got is Kyoshiro, who is primarily in the bathhouse, which gives us a lot of context for what the Shogun is thinking and his paranoia towards this 20-year comeback. We also have Hiyori, who works at the bathhouse, or I guess uh, for the Shogun guy who is at the bathhouse. And I find Hiyori to be a really interesting character. Like, she has swindled so many people promising to be with them if they give her all of their gold. And honestly, I, I respect the hustle. She kind of has, like, Nami vibes. But Hiyori also plays a major role in this arc, not only by being like one of the more important figures in Wano as like the most quote unquote beautiful person, but also being a relative to Momo, connecting her to the main story. Since Momo knows that he has a sister and is somewhat actively looking for her, and in this introduction we only really have like two characters who could be her sister, which is like Otama or Hiyori, so there wasn't really much guest room. We also explore the concept of small fruits, like both Hiyori and Toko are a small part of the story until we finally realize that these characters connect to a much bigger picture. Toko is hunted down for smiling, which of course leads us to Zoro, but that smile also gives us a lot of context towards the small fruits and the side effects that the small fruits have towards those who eat them. Most prominently by removing one's emotions to do anything but laugh. That is conceptually sad, especially through the framing of Wano, as we have a ton of characters who are only capable of eating contaminated scraps left over by the higher class in the system of Wano. And the smile concept very clearly demonstrates who has and hasn't eaten a fruit like this, so we can then later showcase someone like Killer, who was always smiling, and then we're able to learn so much about his circumstances prior to his introduction. You see what I mean? Like, at first these characters are introduced and I thought like, oh, why are we spending time with all of these characters? Like, I don't get it. Do they really matter? Or are they just fleshing out the world? Or are we trying to showcase, like, more side characters? And then we end up rather naturally having all of these characters be a part of the main story in one way or another, and give us context into the broader story of Wano. And while we're diving into all of these side characters, let's talk about the hedgehog guy. Like, this goofy looking guy that also gives us so much more of a broader context to Wano. I'm sure he has a name. But Luffy called him Hedgehog, and that's all I can remember right now. Anyways, in the anime opening, we see that he's getting hung on a cross, and I'm immediately thinking, like, what is his role in the story for this goofy-looking character to just be executed in front of everyone? Smiling, no less! And then we see that one of the reasons why he's hung up and killed is because Hedgehog had a lot of influence in Wano. He had helped a lot of the samurai become who they were supposed to be, and he put a lot of stakes on their back. We have a flashback where Hedgehog has an amazing power move when he asks how much money was stolen and then gives double that in order for these people who uh, once stole to fix themselves up for Odin. I think that is conceptually pretty cool. 
So in Act 1, I was very happy about the fact that we we're getting consequences, and in Act 2, we get even more consequences. Because there are a lot of bad plays in Wano, and the crew is ever more quickly discovered, and this leads to the possibility of the raid's failure. Hedgehog, in that regard, actually plays a role in the story by attempting to downplay the raid, by being this prevalent figure who is both trying to make sure that the enemies aren't aware of what's going on, and to inform the Alliance that no, we're still continuing this raid actually in a very sacrificial circumstance. And we, like in other arcs, are seeing people wanting and caring about the seemingly good influential figure, which, um, <laughs> which, um, in almost every arc, if you were a good person on that island before the Straw Hat showed up, you're either not gonna have a good time, or you're gonna die. Like, those are your two options for your character arc. It was Act 2 that made me realize how many overlapping and interacting parts there are into this arc. We had the enemies of Wano who are already catching up to this whole raid thing since a lot of the Straw Hats were discovered in Act 1. And not only did that lead into this big event where Hedgehog was executed, but we also have a very serious scene where we see Hawkins storming into the bathhouse after finding out about the significance of the tattoos on people's legs, which leads to probably my favorite panel in this entire arc so far, where Hawkins tells everyone to line up and show us your feet because man, that, that is a loaded phrase, Hawkins. I don't think you really know what you're trying to ask the people. Anyways, uh, the other interconnecting plot lines are Zoro, who attempts to take back the Shisui and trying to get a bunch of swords for the revolution, which leads him to acquiring a bunch of weapons, including Enma, which Hiori gives him. And I kind of want to talk about Enma, right? Because we have had cursed weapons in the past, Logtown had one of them, but here it is extremely visible. Like this actually feels like a cursed sword from its destructive power to its effect on the user, and it feels like a notable upgrade from the past weapons. I don't think Zoro really needed to upgrade his weapons at the moment, but uh, also like, hey, it's a, it's a free power up. You don't turn that down. Okay, I do want to talk about two letdowns in this act. Maybe we'll utilize them better in Act 3. I really hope we do. But one of them was Sanji's Power Ranger outfit. Like, his Power Ranger outfit is so cool. Sanji has the ability to turn invisible, and that's something that he's always wanted. He's super dripped out, and it goes hard. Like, yeah, Frankie and Usopp love the suit, but we see Law fangirling over it, and I get it. I am too. But in Act 2, we only really fought for a little bit with a suit, and then we had, like, the bathhouse stuff that happened with Sanji, which I don't know. It felt like Sanji got this really cool thing, and then he's Sanji, so we give him the Sanji tax, and we make him kind of lame. But I wish it was used more. Like, maybe I too am just fangirling, but I, I want more, is what I'm saying. And for my second complaint, I have two words. Big Mom. Amnesia. I really don't like how this was handled. Big Mom already had a questionable reputation for going wedding cake mode in Whole Cake Island, which I tried to defend. But at least in that arc, she felt more like a force of nature who was not to be messed with and could not have been reasoned with. But here, she just forgets to be Big Mom, and that's kind of lame. She ends up washed up on the shore where Chopper finds her, and, like, Big Mom has amnesia, she has no idea where she is or who she is, and it's Chopper who is the only one who could take the shot and could have killed Big Mom right then and there. So, of course, um, you know, he, he doesn't really do anything. He kind of just takes Big Mom to where Luffy is. And that too felt a little bit like a letdown. I think what happened from a writing perspective is that we didn't want Big Mom to meet up with Kaido yet. And so we had to some way or another artificially delay the interaction. We also didn't want Big Mom to fight Luffy yet. And we also needed Luffy to break out of wherever he was stuck in. And so somehow I think that this became the solution to fix all of those issues. But I did not like how she lost her memory. And I hated even more how she regained her memories. Okay, so for the most part, I've just been talking about stuff that happened in Wano. But there's a lot of stuff that happened outside of Wano. Like Moria, who had survived Marineford. No one really dies in One Piece, so it was kind of expected, but now it's confirmed at least. And we have Mihawk telling Perona that she should leave this place because there is an odd subject that had arisen at the Reverie. 
which I think is because of the Fujitora and Dressrosa incident. But anyways, we see Moria come back briefly and head over into full Aled Island, which is gorgeous, by the way. Like, this Rock Skull Island is, it's a really memorable island. And this is where we would have gotten this really cool Moria versus Teach moment. Except that, oh boy, did Moria not plan this out in any way, shape, or form. Moria probably imagined that he would have a really easy Moria versus Teach fight. Oh boy, did he really, did he really not plan this one out? Moria gets attacked by the Impel Down guy and either Moria is gonna have to end up teaming up with Teach or Moria's gonna die here in Full of Lead Island. I can probably see Blackbeard or maybe one of his teammates taking the fruit ability from Moria, but I'm suspecting that Moria's probably not gonna die and that we're gonna get a team up with Teach. Just because Blackbeard has been saying that the Revolutionary Army clashed with the Navy Admirals and that like, it's begun, the battle for supremacy over the throne has begun. So if Moria doesn't have protection from the world government and like big, big things are about to go down, maybe Moria will team up with Blackbeard. So to wrap things up, I really hope we get to see more Germa Suit Sanji. I hope we get better Big Mom characterization, and I really hope that Big Mom and Kaido's teaming up actually feels threatening, because like half the group right now is lacking from a writing perspective. <laughs> Big Mom, what? Uh, my throat, oh man, that was weird. And while we did stumble a little bit, conceptually, we have a lot of really good pieces set up. Like, we have a good portion of the rookies fighting against two emperors. We have a really important person from Wano who just died, just so that the raid would get another chance, and the enemies are still suspicious of the raid. Like, I'm just saying, even with all that happened, Act 3 has a lot of potential. Speaking of Act 3, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna go start reading it. Um, even though I read Act 1 and Act 2, there's still like, what, 80 chapters? Maybe a little bit more or less that I have to read. I'll see you when that's over.